All right. We will try to get started this evening. We're going to be in Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. As we pick up in a study that we started right at the end of last year in the book of Joshua. As we uh, uh, keep up with what the kids are studying in their Bible classes um, Sunday morning and Wednesday evenings, and that will be in Joshua chapter 2, and when we looked at Joshua 1, we talked about how really the, the theme of the book of Joshua, and kind of the main idea that you find over and over again, is the idea of, of courage, of strength in difficult times to, to do the right thing even when it's hard, or uh, even when you're afraid, and that courage in the book of Joshua, uh, even in chapter 1, three different times here. He repeats that phrase, Joshua 1.6, Joshua 1.7, Joshua 1.9, to be strong and of good courage. And uh, <clears throat> looked last time at how good courage is the idea of being alert, of finding strength and courage in alertness, that we haven't fallen asleep, that we're, we're paying attention to what's going on around us and to the choices that we're making. And so then this comes this sort of enthusiasm and passion for being alert, for watching out uh, for uh, our path to match it with God's word. And then the idea of strength, when he says be strong, that's the idea of holding on to something bigger than you, holding tight to something bigger than you, and difficulty, and uh, uh, when things get hard. And so you have Joshua, he says, to, to meditate on God's law day and night, to know God's law backward and forward, to, uh, and that that's what's going to make his way prosperous. And so when things got hard, Joshua grabbed on tighter to God's word. He found an enthusiasm in paying attention to God's word. And it gave him the strength to be courageous and to do uh, great things. And, uh, and, and why shouldn't it for Joshua when God in essence says that his victory is, is guaranteed? If he will just follow the path that God has given he cannot fail. Remember Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5. No man should be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you, and I will not leave you nor forsake you. And so that's kind of the background as we get into chapter 2, where <clears throat> Joshua is preparing to enter the land. They're, they're getting ready to go in. And so it's going to focus still on courage, but... Uh, it emphasizes here the idea of the courage that it takes to submit to God. And I think in chapter 2 especially, you get the idea of the courage that it takes to submit to God, even if you're really the only one who's willing to do it. And that, that's difficult, isn't it? When the right way to go, nobody else wants to go that way. And so it's either you going that way alone or nobody going that way. And, and you think about Rahab's situation. You know, there's a lot of pressure that Rahab is dealing with. You, it, we'll look at that in the first seven verses of Joshua 2. There's a lot of pressure that she's dealing with. And really, in life, the more pressure that you're dealing with, the harder it is to think clearly and to see the evidence for, for what it really is. But Rahab was someone who was slowing things down in her own mind to really think clearly under all of that pressure. So that she came to a conclusion that nobody else in Jericho came to, not, not to the full extent that she did. So let's notice Joshua chapter uh, 2, starting in verse 1, it says, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab, and they lodged there. And so uh, the question I want us to think of while we're going through chapter 2 tonight, the question to keep in mind is, what are these spies looking for? What, why is Joshua sending, what, what, what specifically are they wanting to answer? What question are they trying to answer as they're going into this land? And so picking up in verse 2, it says, And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. And the woman, then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. 
And it happened, as the gate was being shut, when it was dark, that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may still overtake him. Now, this is kind of an interesting account because you have this woman who is lying, and, uh, and she's hiding people and saying things that are clearly not true. And, and she receives salvation because of the actions that she takes. But I want us to think about who Rahab is for a minute. Who has Rahab worshipped up to this point in her life? <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, idols, yeah. Some kind of idol. Whoever Jericho, or whatever idols that Jericho worshipped, she's been worshipping idols. And, uh, and, and what, what does she know about God's law at this point in her life? Yeah. About the God of, of the Israelites. Probably very little. Probably nothing. She probably knows nothing. It's Really, um, as far as a religious law goes, it's quite different than any other ancient law. And, uh, and so she, she would not be familiar with the way that it worked. She probably would have heard nothing of the law itself. You know, the details of the law wouldn't have been explained to her. She, she doesn't know what God has told the Israelites. What, uh, and so you can kind of see she's, she is not in a covenant relationship with God at this point in her life. She has always lived in Jericho. She's always worshipped false gods who do not have the same standards of morality as God does. And, and she's never had an opportunity before today to know any better or different as far as what God would have her to do. And uh, this is really her, her first opportunity to, to come into contact with this. And so a lot of times people try to take Rahab and they try to say, well, this, it, this tells us that in certain circumstances it's okay to lie or in certain situations it's okay but then we still have to come back to passages like 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, just as one example. We could look at a lot of examples. But we still have to come back to passages like 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, where Peter says to the Christian to lay aside all malice and all deceit. And so Rahab did lie here. But Peter tells us we are to lay aside all deceit, that for the Christian, deception and lies are not an acceptable thing to do. And so why does God save her? Well, it's not so much about Rahab lying and not being okay. It tells us something about God. What does Rahab, in her situation, and, and lying about it, but still receiving God's salvation, what does that tell us about the nature of God? It makes me wonder if he planted the notion in her heart or in her mind. Planted the notion. Well, you know, it, it doesn't say anything about God planting a notion in her mind. In fact, she'll tell us how she knows what she knows. She says, I've heard it. And so she, she's heard the stories about it. But I think um, it does It does tell us something about God's nature. Zach? I would just say it's just kind of speaks by how he's judged and he's righteous. Yeah. He's the ultimate judge, and he knows the heart and her reason for doing what she did. Yeah, he's merciful, and he's just, and he's righteous. Zach says that he knows her heart. He knows why she did what she did. Now, that's not to say that God only judges us by our intentions. I think instead what that's to say is God doesn't expect us to know more than we've had a proper opportunity to know. And that's when you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, you know, I told you not to keep company with the sexually immoral. But then he says, but I didn't mean of the world. That our job is not to judge the people who are not yet Christians as if they are Christians and to go out and tell them, well, you're breaking all of these laws and you're doing all these things wrong when they don't even know about salvation or they don't even know the Bible. How could, how could someone who hasn't learned it yet be expected to live the same way that we live or to know what we know? And so given where Rahab is at in her life, she is responding as righteously as she knows how to. And God doesn't quibble over things when people are learning that. Miss Loretta? Mm -hmm. She did lie. Oh, yeah. When she did come into salvation, she did all of it. Sure, yeah. And I, think, I don't think that's to say that she thought, well, I know I'll have to repent of this later. I think she just really did what she thought was right. She thought it that good. But if eventually she, you know, she did learn, then she would have realized in retrospect, just as we all do at <laughs> times, you know, we... We do something and then later learn, oh, I did not know that was sinful, and now I repent of that. She would have had that opportunity. Johnny. Does the scripture also tell us it's not meat that certain sins at one time and no longer good? Yeah, I think that that's uh, from Acts chapter 17. And really the idea there is, you know, you think back to um, 
uh, you know, think back to Abraham. Abraham kind of has the same struggle, and sometimes people try to go to Abraham and say, well, it's okay to lie, because Abraham did, and it turned out okay for him. And, and we have to realize Abraham did not have one ounce of scripture. You know, Genesis was not written when Abraham was alive. He was living it. And so while he certainly had a, a, a relationship with God, and God did communicate with him as he did to all the fathers at that time through the patriarchal system, they did not know what we know. And so they cannot be expected to do everything that we do because they didn't know. They didn't have as much scripture as we do. God works with people as he built, and that's Galatians chapter 5 talks about, at the completion of time, the Christ came. It took time to prepare the world for that, including from creation to Jesus, laying out all the scripture. Miss Faith? Yeah. That's right, yeah. She she can see enough to know whose side she should be on, but that doesn't mean she knows anything about what he requires of her yet. Yeah. That, that, that's what you see, really. Is, yeah. Right. Sure. Yeah, and that's... I, no, I think that's exactly it, and that's that's as we as we get into it, we'll see kind of her character is much more than just her job or the lying that she did, and that she uh, you can see a difference in her compared to every other person in Jericho that she's the only one, and that there's there's something to that that she had the right heart, and she just didn't know any better for what she was doing, and how can she be expected to? Yes. Yeah, the Israelites knew because one of the commandments says that's what I thought they were taught to do. That's right. The Israelites knew that because of God, but she hasn't been exposed to it. She's not heard it yet. That's right. And so in like manner, you know, sometimes or all the time we come across people today who, who don't know God's word, and we can't speak to them as if they do know it well when they haven't had a chance to learn it yet. Uh, that, that process often takes time. They, the Israelites knew it, Johnny said, because they heard the commandment, one of the Ten Commandments, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not lie about your neighbor, but she had no way to know that yet. And so God's not holding her accountable in this moment for something she couldn't have heard. Uh, but further back in history, a lot of people just got zapped and didn't get warned. You know, I think that's, you're looking at individual cases. So the people who got zapped, actually that's, uh, you have... Nadab and Abihu was one of those. But they were at a very high position. They had maybe the most information available to them, and so they should have known more. And so therefore, God, God had given them all the information they needed to know what to do, and they just chose not to do it. And so he had to deal with that in a different way. And that's, you see, we, we, we try to make these things very black and white. And, you know, God said this, and so everybody is either doing this perfect or they're not doing it perfect. And God just zaps people who don't. And, and God cares about where you are. And he knows that we're all in a different place. And he wants us all to get to the same place, the same amount of knowledge, the same obedience. That's what we're all striving for. But God doesn't pretend like we're all just born in the exact same spot. He sees that we all have to, to grow and learn at different paces. And, and he has made space for that within the plan of salvation. Is there another hand over here? Yes, Miss Tammy. We're just saying at this point in her life, she really did the these cases of people lying, you know, really what you see is you do see a degree of lack of faith, and that if she really understood who God was, she would have just been honest and known that God could have still worked all of it out. And that's, but but it's okay that she was, God really apparently feels that it's okay that she's not there yet. That's really kind of the point is, later, when she learned about lying, she was going to have to repent of this. You know, it's not that it was right to lie. But because she didn't know about this yet, God doesn't just zap her dead that moment because she lied. He's patient and works with her. And so, as we continue then, 
in verse 6, it says, uh, But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of the flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. And then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan, to the fords. And as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they, they shut the gate. And so you see here, she's under a lot of pressure. She's making a lot of decisions, sort of on the fly, trying to decide how to best handle the situation. And it picks up in verse 8. He says, before, now before they lay down, so this, this is really kind of in the middle of what has just happened. He's kind of going back and giving us more details about when she sent them up on the roof, but before she completely hid them, uh, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in any one of uh, in any one because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. And so this is all the pressure, all the things going on. There's these men who have come to her from uh, from the nation of the Israelites to spy out the land. It'd be easy for her to turn them in and, and collect the reward or whatever it is that would happen. There's the king who's pressuring her to tell her where did they go. And then there's her trying to figure out how to handle all this, knowing expecting that God of the Israelites is going to win. And she has this opportunity to, to connect with these people who serve this God. She's still able, despite all that pressure, to think it all the way through and say, the God that I'm serving aren't really going to do diddly squat, apparently. They're, they're not strong enough to stop this from coming. I think I know who I need to belong to. I think I know who I need to side with. And that, I think that's a tremendous amount of uh, of thought um, under so much pressure. And that's in verse 11. Now remember the theme of Joshua is the idea of courage. And she says, neither did there remain any more courage in anyone. Literally, what it says there is breath. There did not remain a breath in anyone. If, you know, have you ever been so afraid that you lost, you kind of like, it's like you were punched in the gut and you couldn't breathe? Uh, or, um, you know, breath represents life. And so she's like, in essence, we're, we all are walking dead men here. We recognize that there's nothing left for us, that, that we're all just going to die here in Jericho because your God can clearly do anything he wants to. She says, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. She recognizes that the way that they thought about gods was they thought of them as as local to lo to a specific location. And so do you remember the story when uh, the Israelites are, are fighting an army and they lose in the mountains? And so they say, well, your God must be a God of the mountains, so we'll fight you in the valleys and we'll win there because our God is the God of the valleys. They thought that, that God was just a God of one place. And that if they could just move to a different place, then they would win. And then they tried that, and they lost in the valleys too. Rahab uh, realizes this is not a God who is bound to one location. He wins in Egypt. He wins uh, across the Jordan River with Sihon and Og. He, wherever he goes, he wins. And so he must be a God who is Lord over all the earth and the sky as well. And so if you, if you have that kind of God, then some piddly local God isn't going to be able to help you. And so she says, we have no more breath in us. We have no more courage to fight. But what sets apart Rahab from everyone else who's in Jericho? What, what makes her different? She knows what they all know, and they're all terrified. What makes Rahab different from everybody else? She acted on it. That's right. They all believe. And that's, if you think about James chapter uh, 2, in James chapter 2 and verse 19, everybody in Jericho believed that they were going to die. That's why their hearts melted, she said. Mm -hmm. And it's just like what James says in James chapter 2. In James chapter 2 and in verse 19, uh, James says, You believe that there is one God. You do well. That's, that's a good start. But even the demons believe, and all that they do about it is tremble. They're just terrified. Uh, there's no action that they're taking in order to, to change their situation. And so he says, belief is a good start. 
the people of Jericho believe, but then in verse 25, as he talks about uh, faith that you act on, he says, likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? She believed she's the only one who did something about it. And because she's the only one who did something about it, she's the only one who was saved. And it's a very good picture of how faith is really so much more than just something you know. It's got to be a knowledge that moves you to action. Uh, yeah, Penny. Yeah. And, and the thing that was happening around them, there had to have been spies, if you will, or people that hit, running ahead of them, seeing sure. what's going on, and they were telling what they saw. Oh, yeah. And it didn't put the fear in them. And Rahab, she had some faith. That's, that's right, yeah. She, they could do, and, and uh, so she had courage along with that faith. That's right. That she probably had seen anything for herself and even the things she described she maybe wasn't even alive for some of the you know she talked about the red sea that had been 40 something years earlier she maybe wasn't even born with that happened she certainly wasn't in egypt and uh you know a lot of the things she hadn't seen but she had heard the and heard the evidence and uh and believed it believed it enough to act on it and that's kind of the same idea in hebrews chapter 11 and verse 31 of course Hebrews 11 is what we often call the, the Hall of Fame uh, of Faith, the Hall of Faith that, uh, um, yeah, that she's in it. That, you know, these people who by faith, they believed, and that led them to do something. And they all, everyone in this chapter does something. Hebrews 11, 31, by faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe. So here he says they didn't believe. Now, we know they believed here. They, they knew that God could destroy them, because it says their hearts melted. They believed here, but in Hebrews 11, he says it wasn't a real belief. It wasn't a real faith, because they didn't do anything about it. They didn't take action to change their circumstances. Uh, she did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. She believed enough to do something. That's what makes Rahab different from everybody else. And, uh, and that's what she says when you get into verse 12. She says... Uh, now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house, and give me a true token, and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. So the men answered her, Our lives for yours, if none of you uh, tell this business of ours, and it shall be uh, when the Lord has given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Now, this is, this is, you can see, she doesn't really understand who God is yet, because she has a very transactional kind of mindset about deity, and that, ancient people, that's, that's how people who didn't know the true God, who worshipped idols, they thought of, of God as someone that you went to, kind of like a banker, you know, I, I would like to loan something from you, and I'll give you collateral, and, and we'll trade back and forth, and I scratch your back, and you scratch my back, which is not how, how God works. But it's how they thought of the gods, and that's, she says, I did you a kindness, and so you do me a kindness. I scratch your back, you scratch my back, but that's okay. She doesn't have to know more than that today. She knows enough to see that he's the God to submit to, and even though nobody else is, she's willing to do that. Did you have something, Ms. Yeah. Stevens? Yes. Did they tell her a lot? Did they tell her the Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a. I appreciate that, Miss Cena, because that's exactly um, where we're going to. Is is God had a very particular plan that she had to follow, and and do you think she would have been saved if she didn't follow it? And so, uh, but as we uh, are looking at verse fourteen, when when they they answer her and they say, uh, if you don't tell this the, this business of ours, then we'll deal kindly with you. We'll deal truly with you. We need you to protect this secret. If we had never read this before, and this is the first time we'd ever read the book of Joshua, what would be surprising about their response in verse 14? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's sometimes... Okay, yeah, and that, I think that, that does get to it, that these spies, 
have the authority to promise Rahab this. And and why why would that be surprising that they that they would feel comfortable making this kind of deal with a woman from Jericho? Why why would that be surprising to you? Because God gave them gave them that feeling of what to go and, and be okay. It, and I think that's um perhaps what Miss Peggy is getting at is is uh God specifically told them to destroy everyone. I mean, think back to Deuteronomy chapter twenty. In Deuteronomy chapter twenty. And uh, verse 16, and so they, more than a feeling, they had direct commands from God. And in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 16, and, uh, <clears throat> well, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 20. Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 16, it says, But of the cities of those people, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance, so that's in the promised land, like Jericho, you shall let nothing that breathes remains alive. And here, here's a direct command from God. Nothing that breathes, but you shall utterly destroy them. The Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, just as the Lord your God has commanded. Lest they teach you to do according to all their abominations which they have done for their gods, and your sin, and you sin against the Lord your God. And so they had said, destroy everything. Leave not a person alive. Here they're saying, well, we will save your family. How can they feel comfortable saying that? What did they understand that maybe sometimes we miss about the law of Moses? Why did God want them to destroy everyone? Because the way he got rid of all the bad people. Yes, yeah. And in Deuteronomy 20 and verse 18, he says specifically, because they'll teach you to worship idols. And they do later on, that's right. So what makes Rahab different? She, was she wasn't going to worship idols anymore. That's right. They understood if she was rejecting idolatry, then she wasn't anymore under that command to be destroyed. Now she's one of God's people. She's a victor, just like they are. And so she is now a part of the people who are conquering the land, not a part of the people who are being destroyed. And that's... People sometimes talk about, you know, the destruction of Jericho, which was total. Other than Rahab and her family, complete destruction. The walls fell down and everyone died. Sometimes people talk about the destruction of different cities in the promised land as this sort of vengeful and mean and hateful God. And they miss the fact that God told Abraham in Genesis 15 that he would not kick those people out until their sins had been stacked up to the sky and that he was waiting for the time when they would no longer repent. As long as they were willing to repent, he would not destroy them, even though he had promised the land to Abraham. He promised the land to Abraham because he knew he would get to that point eventually. But he said it would be 400 years before that happened, uh, or four generations ago. Well, anyway, so he, uh, he says, uh, I, I won't destroy people who will repent. And even when they had reached that point, there's one family who will repent, and God is willing to save them. Don't you think? If they had marched up to Jericho and the whole city had said, we repent and we'll worship only God, God would have just squished them anyway? No. He would have forgiven them. That's what happened to Nineveh. The entire city, destined for doom and destruction. Not a person died. God saved the whole city because they repented. That's all that God wanted. And so why did the people in the promised land die, the ones who they did kill? Because they wouldn't repent. Because God knew their hearts, and he knew that they were past the point of repentance, just like Hebrews chapter 6 uh, says. And so it comes back to what Zach was saying earlier. God is always just and fair. And so if God allows somebody to die in their sins, like these people here, it's because God knew that they weren't going to repent. And so that that's it for them, just like Hebrews 6 says. Uh, Miss Pay, did you have something? I think that, I think it's, well, it's, I think that's a good question. She asked why God did so many things. Why did he choose this woman? You know, he could have, he could have, he did miraculous things to save people before. Why choose this woman right now? And I think that goes back to, um, why, why does he choose anyone to do his will? Because they choose to do it. 
he he knew who in Jericho, you know, in the great scheme of providence, why did they go to a harlot named Rahab? Why didn't they go somewhere else? Why didn't they just hide somewhere where no one could see them? Why, why did they go to her? Well, I think that in providence, God worked it out where they ended up at her door. And, uh, and because God knew her heart. God knew there was someone in that city who would say yes to him, and he put that one person in contact with the only people who could explain what to do to be saved. And so I think it's because God loves all people, and he always puts people together who will help each other be saved. John? What she says to him and how she says it is so that she had already had a change in attitude. That's right. Yeah. She's just waiting for the opportunity, maybe praying for it. Um, Loretta? Sure. That's right. That's right. And and the only person who survived, well, her family, but it's because of her. And that's what Miss Tina was talking about. She really is just a tremendously awesome person who knew no better up to this point, and now has the opportunity to know better. And God chose her and loved her, regardless of her race or gender or anything. Despite of her sins. Because despite of her sins as well. Because her heart was right, because she wanted to do what was right, because she she would listen and believe and take action. And at the end of the day, that's the kind of person that God is looking for. Not a man or a woman or white or black or anything else. He's just looking past all of that. That's what he said in First Samuel 16 when he said, God doesn't see the flesh, he sees the heart. God looks past all of that to say, are you willing to do what's right? Um, let's see, I know I saw another hand over here. You know, God Steve, doesn't destroy yes. the righteous with the wicked. And he knows the hearts of men like you're talking about. And so when they came there, you know, he gave her opportunity to prove herself. That's right. Just like Abraham got his opportunity to prove himself. That's right. And so yes. that's what was going on. And she didn't do it perfectly, and God was still patient. No, because right. he's, We're not going to do it perfectly. That's right. That's we right. are imperfect. That's right. And and he still works with us. And Steve said, God knows how to save the righteous even while he destroys the wicked. That's what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2. He says, uh, just like righteous Lot, who was tormented by the sins that he saw around him day and night, God knew how to save him and only him and his and his daughters, even when he destroyed it. He can destroy a group and save one person out of it if we just believe and take action on what he says. Uh, Melanie, or er, King. Um, I was just going to say that if we she would want him to change her life and knew the strength she, she knew what God had done right. for all the but Israelites. And I think it was more of an act of mercy mm -hmm. upon their part for her to be able to be saved sure. her household. <coughs> That's right. It's it's uh you see their mercy and God's mercy. Aren't we glad that God doesn't expect us to know everything before he before we can accept salvation? That God doesn't expect us to be perfect before we can get in the waters of baptism. None of us would be able to. And so just as uh, just as Rahab here made some mistakes while she was trying to figure it out, we sometimes we often we all do too, and God still works with us. And so um as we continue then, and just just thinking about the evidence of Rahab. You remember Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5? And in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5, we're told that there was a man named Salmon. I don't know how they said it, but I call him Salmon because that's how they spell it. And, uh, and Salmon had a son named Boaz by a woman named Rahab. And so what does that tell us about Rahab? Well, it tells us, I think, a couple of things. First of all, it tells us she converted to, to this religion. Because Salmon could not have married her rightfully. And we're told that this generation was faithful. This generation under Joshua and the elders who followed at the end of the book of Joshua, they did it right. And so he could not have married her if she was still worshiping idols. That's what makes her different. And second, when you think about Boaz, now from the book of Ruth, Boaz, he is a tremendous person. I mean, he is kind and righteous. He's good. He had good parents is what I think. I think he probably had excellent parents. And she was his mother. And so you see here that while she doesn't have it all right yet, she's going to learn a lot. And, and she's going to have a son, and she's going to raise him really well. And she's going to make a lot of changes in her life and do a lot of things different 
once she's a part of this group and married to Salmon and a mother to Boaz. And of course, they are in the line of David and then later, of course, Jesus. And so it's quite an honor for her to be a part of that. And she's a part of it because even when nobody else would, she listened to what God had done and said, wow, I've got to be a part of that, not what I'm doing over here. And she was willing to make whatever changes necessary and do whatever she had to to be a part of it. And God heard that and honored it. And, uh, and I think it shows you really the qualities that God looks for in people. And so, yes. That is true. That's from, uh, no, so that's Deuteronomy 20 describes that. And she's, she's, uh, Melanie is correct that typically in most circumstances, if the people of, of Israel were in war and they went to this place and they fought and they saw a beautiful woman, they were allowed to take her as their wife. That was allowed under the law of Moses. But he says, except in the promised land, except for in Jericho and Jerusalem and all of those places, he had that, and that's what we read earlier, this exception, because he says those people are so steeped in idolatry, they will not change. They will just lead you away from me. And, and so... That's right, yeah. And so, so they, uh, uh, they, the fact that they didn't get rid of all of them uh, caused them trouble for generations and generations, and you do still see some impact of that, but... but uh, but they, um, and so there, there was this one exception there where they couldn't save the women of uh, Jericho, and that's that's what, you know it really it's 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 very interesting to think about it from this perspective of understanding God when He says something because I I could I'm fairly certain about this nowhere in Genesis through Deuteronomy does it say specifically the words unless they want to convert, and then don't kill them. It doesn't say that. But they understood that God meant that because they understood the reason for the law, destroy everyone because they're going to take you into idolatry if you don't, and they understood the nature of God. God wants to save everyone, and so if someone wants to convert, of course he wants to save them. God didn't have to, to clarify any further. They just thought about God's word and understood that in this situation. And it, it shows you something about what's required in Bible study. That it's not all just, well, read it and do it. He does require us to think about it, to understand his nature, and to uh, and to consider how it applies to us specifically. Yes. A different. Right. And not so much that, that it was that he thought it was okay and he changed his mind, but that, like I said, he's dealing with people where they're at. And not having had a law before, he's trying to paint a picture. Do you think he's creating a situation where Jesus can come, whom we've told was always his plan from before the foundation of the world in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, he's creating an environment where the Messiah can come and be judged by a very strict law so that nobody can say, or we can say with certainty, he didn't sin. And so he created this really strict law so that he could create this environment for the Messiah to come and have the opportunity to save us. And so he's the same God, but he certainly isn't afraid to uh, to change the covenant if that's what's best, and, and that's what he does. And so we pick up then in verse 15, and once there is belief, once, once someone believes and is willing to make changes, then you get what Tina was talking about earlier, uh, that there's a plan to be followed. So verse 15, she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall, and she said to them, Get to the mountain, lest the pursuers uh, meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Afterward, you may go your way. So the men said to her, We will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you bind the line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all of your father's household to your own home, so it shall be that whoever goes in outside the door of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his, <coughs> excuse me, on his own head. And and uh, 
his blood will be on his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from your oath which you made us swear. And she said, According to your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. And so, uh, as Tina said, they give a lot of stipulations. There's this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And you think, it's not a forgiving situation. If someone leaves the house during when the walls are falling down, it's not going to be like, oh, hurry. You know, they just get squished. There's nothing, there's nothing that can be done to stop that. And so they've got to follow it to a T if they're going to uh, if they're going to be safe. And you think about what Rahab is is agreeing to here. Now she's got to go and she's got to find her father and she's got to find her siblings. She's got to find her family. She's got to explain all this to them and she's got to keep it a secret from everybody else because if if it gets out, then they're not bound by this this agreement anymore. But she does it, and that's it says at the end of verse 21, she bound the scarlet cord in her window. That's kind of the Bible's way of saying she committed to doing it. And, you know, I don't know how much of her family came. It doesn't tell us if her father came or not, if her mother believed her, or if they laughed at her, or if they were just so scared that they chose not. We don't know who came other than Rahab. But whoever was in that house that day, they lived because of what Rahab did. And then finally in verses 22 to 24, the spies departed. They went to the mountain. They stayed there three days until the pursuers returned. The pursuers sought, <coughs> excuse me, sought them all along the way, but did not find them. So the two men returned and descended from the mountain. They crossed over. They came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they told him all that had befallen them. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has delivered all the land into our hands, for indeed all the inhabitants of the country are faint-hearted because of this. And so... Uh, Back to the question from the beginning of class, what were the spies looking for specifically in the land? You know, I'm sure they looked at, at the size of the city and how it was laid out and the path to get there, but, but what was the question they really wanted to answer in spying out the land? How fierce is it? Could they conquer it? Yeah, could they conquer it? How fierce is the enemy? And specifically in verse 24, truly the Lord has delivered into our hands for indeed all the inhabitants are faint-hearted because of it. They are looking for evidence that what God said is true. They are looking to see if God's claims are, are accurate, and they, they found that evidence. It's kind of like a Gideon when he goes down into the camp, and the guy talks about his dream, about how uh, in his dream, Gideon, you know, um, I can't remember exactly what happened, but I think he rolled a tent over or something, and, and they say, Here's the evidence. God is going to give it to us. It's, it's kind of like the Bereans in Acts chapter 17. It says they were more fair-minded because they searched the scriptures daily to see, are these things true? And that's, that's the example that we have, that, that we hear what we believe to be God's word, and then we go back and we check, is that actually what God's word says? And we look for the evidence that things are exactly as we are told that they are. Uh, Kenny? Did not Rahab have more faith? In a way, I think that's true. It's kind of like what Jesus says at the end of the book of John uh, when he says that uh, Thomas, he says, you know, blessed is Thomas because he sees and believes, but even more blessed are those who do not see and believe. And that's that's us. We don't get the chance to touch Jesus' side or his hand. We have the evidence that we need, but we don't have sight like he did. And he says even more blessed. And so in a way, I think that's very true. <coughs> They're preparing uh, by comparing God's claim so that their faith is increased. Rahab has only heard about it, but she believes enough to do something. But, you know, at the end of the day, because God is merciful, it didn't really matter. You can have the kind of faith that's only heard and believes. You can have the kind of faith that has looked at every inch of evidence and then believes. As long as you have the faith that does something, God is patiently working with each one of us. And so you have two examples of two kinds of faith. And, and people putting their faith into action. But as long as they're putting their faith into action, from wherever they're standing, as long as they're growing closer to God and believing Him more, God patiently keeps working with them. And, and they're all saved at the end of the day. And so, any last thoughts or comments on Joshua chapter 2? All right. Well, um, Johnny, do you want to come up here? And uh, we'll wrap up there. And next week we'll be in uh, Joshua 3 and 4.